Good evening here in New York and on the East Coast. Uh, Ohio gozaimasu to everyone in Tokyo and wherever you're from. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Joshua Walker here at Japan Society. I'm excited about tonight's event. Now, maybe the topics may not be uh, as exciting or maybe they'll be too exciting for 2021. We're talking about global risk in 2021, major threats and emerging concerns. And I can't think of a better panel to talk about everything going on. We all had a hard 2020. And I think about when we had this exact event last year, at least one of our participants was there. And when we talk about the issues we were talking about then to where we are now, it seems like it's been a decade. Uh, it seems that 2021 is not getting any easier. There's so many risks to talk about the current global landscape, things from what's going on in Washington to what the US-China relationship is going to look like, what the financial markets have in store for us. Let's identify the major threats and emerging concerns. Before I introduce our panel, let me just quickly thank our sponsors for our business and policy program, our global leaders, including City and Deloitte. Uh, and our corporate sponsors, including Mizuho Financial Group and Toyota uh, Motors of North America. So let me introduce our speakers in alphabetical order. Uh, we have Gaddy Epstein, uh, the China Affairs Editor of The Economist. Thanks for joining us, Gaddy. We have Jane Harmon, who's both the director and president and CEO of the Wilson Center, but also a longtime Washington insider who's a congresswoman for nine terms and has been on every security uh, affairs uh, in, in, in Washington. Thank you, uh, Congressman Harmon, for joining us tonight. And then last but certainly not least, we have the chief risk officer of Morgan Stanley, uh, Keishi Hotsuki, and also a member of the Japan Society board. Hotsuki-san, thank you uh, for joining us as well. Uh, Congresswoman Harmon, let me start with you there in Washington, given that so much of 20, 2021 has begun in Washington. January 6th obviously was a risk that many people didn't see coming. Uh, what's your assessment in terms of how we look at global risk from there in Washington where you're sitting today? Well, I call Washington uh, the entertainment capital of the world. Um, uh, it is amazing uh, how much is going on here that's of interest to people here, but also everywhere. And I say that uh, more in sorrow than, than in humor, uh, because I, I would wish that Washington uh, were, were, had returned to stable government, was making big progress on uh, on, on combating COVID and uh, that the news stories have died down. That would be my, my alternate universe, but that's not our universe. Uh, uh, the airwaves are full of the second impeachment of Donald Trump hearings uh, and, and they're interesting. I have to say they're interesting and they follow what was a terrifying event, probably uh, the most terrifying event in my lifetime. And I was here in Washington on 9-11 as a member of Congress, as a senior member of Congress. Uh, and, and I was also here uh, in the 70s when uh, there was something called the, the, the uh, Saturday Night Massacre, which was uh, an order by Richard Nixon uh, for the Attorney General to fire someone who had done a study of Watergate, and that, and that Attorney General refused, the dep and he was fired, the Deputy Attorney General refused, and he was fired, and some of us thought the government would become unglued. So it's a kind of long way to answer you, but... Uh, the mood here is uncertain. Uh, the future here is uncertain. Um, the good news is that uh, President Biden has put together, I think, a very competent uh, administration. And they're not all confirmed yet, but the, the ones who are very competent, uh, including certainly our Secretary of State. And uh, I, I think that if we get through this near period, uh, that we will start to have the boring, uh, improvements that I that I'm hoping for. Great, thank you, Gaddy. Let me come to you. You focus on China. There's a lot of talk about 2021 being shaped uh, by a collision course between the United States and China. How do things look to you from a Chinese and an Asian perspective for 2021? Yeah, I, well, I think the good news is, I in terms of like uh, steering towards a conflict, uh, I I don't think China is operating on a timeline of trying to trying to create trouble in 2021, um, at least not to the level of uh, where, you, where you'd have a crisis. But, uh, but the bad news is that, that, that China has been increasing its provocations kind of in all directions uh, in the region, in the East China Sea, uh, in the South China Sea. Uh, it is, its activities have uh, increased with respect to the Senkakus, Taiwan, um, and in the South China Sea, even even sending uh, you know submarine surveillance drone into 
uh, Indonesian waters uh, upsetting, upsetting Jakarta. Uh, and this is both in the waterways, um, in airspace. Um, you know, there, a lot of people probably haven't heard of a little island called uh, Platas, and I hope I pronounced it correctly myself. Um, that uh, belongs to Taiwan. Uh, it's actually closer to Hong Kong than to Taiwan mainland. And uh, it's, it's a couple of miles long. It's home to more, probably more, or certainly more lobsters than Taiwanese uh, humans. Uh, it, it stations about 500 Marines. Uh, but a few days after Biden was inaugurated, China sent in uh, aircraft on January 23rd and 24th, like 11 aircraft on the 23rd, 15 on the 24th. It happened to be when uh, the USS Theodore Roosevelt group uh, was transiting in the area. And uh, those aircraft uh, reportedly simulated uh, missile attacks um, on the group. Now, of course, this is just, uh, you know, just an exercise, but it's the kind of uh, provocative exercise that China has been doing more and more of in the region. And uh, that certainly increases risk, um, even if it's not uh, backed by sort of any sort of near-term intent. Um, and hanging over all this is what is what does China want to do with respect to Taiwan? And then if you step back a, a bit and look around the region, you see um, pretty much everybody's increasing their military budgets. Japan for the ninth straight year. Um, even under Moon in South Korea, the military budget has increased and is actually increasing at a faster pace than it was um, before he took, took office. Uh, you have Taiwan increasing military spending, and of course the U.S. showing uh, a lot of interest and continued interest under Biden in supporting Taiwan and bolstering its defenses. So you you kind of uh, you have uh, it's not a powder keg, but you have a a region where there's a lot of activity going on that that looks worrying. That's a good place to pick up with the chief risk officer from Morgan Stanley, Hotsky-san. The the picture that we've just heard from D.C in Asia is not encouraging. How do you, uh, you professionally have to kind of manage risk uh, for Morgan Stanley. How do you think about uh, the financial markets specifically, but more broadly in terms of the types of uh, geopolitical risk that we just heard? How do you think about 2021? Yeah, thanks Joshua. And uh, I wanna quickly go back to the conversation we had in the same format last year, you know, one year ago, and this was uh, literally just before the COVID uh, started to strike the US and Europe. And I remember the message at that time was uh, actually I was uh, more pessimistic. And I remember that my comment was that uh, the market has uh, a lot of complacency. And uh, and now coming one year after, you know, going through this roller coaster ride of the 35% uh, drop in equity markets and the quick recovery with uh, government supports and the Federal Reserve support, my picture right now is actually more optimistic than a year ago. So it's a uh, it's a very risky thing to for me to say as a chief risk officer because I'm usually more cautious and pessimistic. But the financial market has a, uh, ironically, has a, a lot of positive momentum right now. And mainly because of the government support and uh, uh, central bank support. That, as you, mean, you know, many of you know, that if you add the, all the government support in the US, adding together from the Trump and Biden administration, that's close to $6 trillion. That's close to 25% of the entire GDP. That dramatically changed the landscape of the financial market. And, and because of that, uh, the market have a very strong perspective about how this is going to be the recovery market. The other thing we take a, a serious look at, uh, serious look is, uh, you know, clearly the, uh, the, the uh, prospect for the vaccines. And uh, our research who uh, follow, Morgan Stanley's research follow very closely but what happening on the vaccine development and production and the perspective. And, and we still have a very promising view where most likely the production of the vaccine is going to follow by the, at least in the, in the middle of the summer uh, or the latest in the early uh, uh, fall. And hopefully by the year and the end, uh, there'll be a much 
better situation uh, going towards the herd immunity. So for those reasons, I think the picture is, uh, is, is arguably more brighter. But after that, I, I can definitely mention the uh, three or four items that you know, I'm still concerned about. Okay, we'll come back to those three or four, four items. You'll leave us hanging there. Uh, Congresswoman uh, Harriman, um, we're talking about US foreign policy and kind of a different tone, certainly. You talked about the experienced team that Biden has brought. I mean, you've looked at everything from US foreign policy in Congress to Europe and the Middle East. What's your, what's your view of kind of the world that the Biden administration has inherited, uh, giving advice there in Washington? How would you prioritize the risk from a US foreign policy point of view uh, moving forward? Well, let me say first, I agree with the last comment that there, there's almost a, an eerie disconnect between the messy government we have and the strong economy we have. Uh, and I think that has to do um, uh, with the fact that there are these giant stimulus packages. And, and at the moment anyway, there doesn't seem to be any inflationary impact of that. But you know, I, I defer to the experts here, but I, to my knowledge, there doesn't seem to be that yet. And a lot of economists, not everybody, not Larry Summers, think that spend, spend, spend is the right way to go. Uh, and that if the economy bounces back, we'll grow our way out of the, the debt issue and et cetera. But anyway, uh, that's, a, that's the, 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 the total sum of my economic knowledge. In terms of uh, US foreign policy, uh, well, we have to be strong at home to be strong abroad. So, so there is a, a connection here and Biden gets that. I mean, we have to make more progress on COVID and I had my second back, my second uh, vaccination today, and so far I feel okay. Uh, you know, if I fall over in ten minutes, you'll forgive me. But, uh, but it is still very hard to get enough vaccines into locations where people are and need them and qualify under all the age rules and whatever else. Uh, so, and and you know, we're we're supposedly going to use the national guard and and take over football stadiums and all this stuff. And I, but I don't think there's enough vaccine to make that work yet. So step one is that. Step two is economic recovery related to that. Uh, but there are gonna be a lot of issues because of uh, the more modern economy and fewer jobs. Um, Japan doesn't have that problem because I think Japan has a very low birth rate. So maybe that, that helps Japan. But, but anyway, foreign policy. Let's assume we become stronger at home. What do we do? Um, it's not enough just to sign a bunch of executive orders overturning everything that Trump did. And frankly, I think Trump did a few things right. Uh, as it, for example, uh, USMCA, the US-Mexico uh, agreement, uh, US-Mexico-Canada agreement. I think uh, uh, that was an actual trading agreement uh, with modern provisions and, by, and uh, Trump was able to get that done with, with bipartisan votes from Congress. So I give him credit for that. Uh, but going forward, uh, overturning everything else is not, it, it is, I don't think it's enough of a signal uh, that the U.S. wants to return to the liberal world order or wants to renew the liberal world order, which is what my wish would be. I think we have to not just rejoin alliances, but uh, apologize and earn our way back to a trusting relationship. And we're starting to do that. I also think uh, if it's possible, and uh, I gather from a lot of people, and uh, again, the other panelists would know better, that that um, a, a priority is not going to be, not going to be rejoining uh, some of the trading blocks and the trading arrangements uh, like TPP, um, if, if we were even welcome back. Uh, there are huge anti-trade wings in both political parties which are gonna resist this, the far left and the far right. And I think that Biden is not making that his priority. I think what he's making his priority, and again, we have an expert here, is figuring out the China relationship. And I think that's a very hard thing to figure out. And also um, maybe uh, trying to figure out a way back or forward to an agreement with Iran uh, and, and a course correction on Afghanistan, which at least by my lights is gonna fall if we just leave the the, this agreement with the Taliban in place, uh, this inadequate agreement with the Taliban in place, and then uh, a course correction on Yemen. So those are things that I think are high on his list. And um, uh, again, COVID, COVID, COVID is, is uh, 
I think are, are, has to be our priority. Great, thank you. Uh, Gaddy, let's just pick up where you left off and where I think Congresswoman Harmon uh, left us there. Um, you, you, you talked about this very particular island that could lead to further conflict. Uh, we just heard uh, that US-China, it's the game is there. Even when you talk about COVID, it seems to be a competition, almost a zero sum game between the US and China. But it seems like both of us are losing fairly miserably. Neither of us have been particularly good at our response. We may have faltered worse, but it's not that China is looking that much better. Uh, what is the outlook for US China relations under the Biden administration? And then more importantly, with President Xi seemingly in place forever, uh, how does that change the calculation given the messiness of our domestic politics comparatively to the authoritarian system in China? Yeah, great question. Uh, well, I think the Biden administration has made clear uh, kind of repeatedly, and I think Tony Blinken uh, uh, re-emphasized this uh, recently in public remarks, that uh, the, the, they felt that the direction of the directionally and attitudinally the Trump administration was taking uh, the appropriate sort of uh, line on China. It's just that it was going, uh, going about it all wrong. That's their, that's their view. And, that, and that's what uh, you know, I have felt uh, talking to them in advance of taking over in this administration is that their intention uh, was to kind of blend uh, a Trumpian approach or attitude uh, with real strategy. And that starts with alliances. Um, uh, and I think, I think the good news about the scenario I laid out earlier, the worrying scenario I laid out earlier, is that China has a good a galvanizing effect um, in the region. Um, on, on other countries to get along. Uh, and I think there's, there's a lot of incentive uh, for, for almost every neighbor in the region to talk more with the US uh, and for the Biden administration to engage uh, with them. And that, that is clearly a priority of the Biden administration to work with allies and trying to rebuild trust with allies yeah. around the region. So that's, that's actually the good news. Uh, in terms of direct US-China uh, relations. That's going to be really tricky. And uh, we've just written about that um, in a couple different ways uh, this weekend and some prior weeks. It's really tough to, to work with a country that you're also uh, uh, calling a, uh, you know, a genocidal actor. Uh, so it's going to be tricky. I mean, the uh, Biden administration, Joe Biden himself has made clear that he's placing values at the center of his foreign policy. At least he said that publicly. Uh, that human rights matters to him. The rejoining the Human Rights Council, I think you can expect, I, I would expect them to introduce a resolution at the Human Rights Council on Xinjiang. It would be the first time that the Human Rights Council has ever introduced such, uh, you know, such, an, such a resolution uh, on China. Uh, and what I was told by other members of it is that it, takes, it would take US leadership to do it. So, you know, US is kind of the only country that, that actually historically uh, has been willing to Kind of stick its neck out, uh, standing up to China on human rights in this in you know recent years. And I think that's going to continue to happen, um, and also with sincerity from Joe Biden, as opposed to, of course, Donald Trump, uh, you know, privately assuring uh, Xi Jinping that to go ahead and uh, build the camps in Xinjiang, and uh, and essentially giving him a green light in Hong Kong. So, but so that's that's great news in terms of values. It's it makes things very challenging uh, in terms of working with China when there clearly are uh, areas where the world needs China to be a good actor, you know, on climate change, on nuclear security, um, you know, help, you know, helping with uh, North Korea. I mean, there's, there's a lot of areas where, um, and in trade, you know, there are a lot of areas where the world, world and the US uh, need and want China to be uh, a good actor. And I think a lot of that's going to happen, uh, you know, whether or not it happens is going to be because China perceives it to be its in, in its own interest. And maybe that will be the challenge of the Biden administration to, to help China see its own interests in those areas while still trying to hold it to account uh, for you know, human rights atrocities. Okay. Holsky san you, you left us in, in suspense of the three or four things you're worried about, but also uh, I'd love uh, you to weigh in on some of these bigger risks that we're talking about <clears throat> and how it, how it affects your outlook and how you think about, um, you know, from the private sector point of view, the disconnect we've talked about between the financial markets versus the geopolitical world and, and perhaps a lack of leadership more broadly in the democratic world, not just in America. Uh, we see it in Brexit. We, we, we're kind of, we've got a leadership deficit, it feels like. How do you think about this? Well, first of all, um, 
in general, I think the market is definitely positive about uh, what the Jane mentioned, which is that Biden administration is creating more predictable and stable uh, governance. It's definitely the positive uh, for the economy and the market. Uh, but going back to the point I want to address as a, as a potential concerns, uh, again, none of them is an immediate concern of uh, you know, considering a significant market correction. But I think uh, in the next uh, two years, uh, I think this is, the, these are the emerging concerns uh, I, I was listing. So uh, I'll call it as a four C's, a cap, you know, uh, letter C's. The number one is uh, what Gary mentioned is about China. Uh, China is definitely the potential factor uh, for the potential uh, surprise uh, in many different ways. The second one I want to list is a climate risk. And the climate risk, you know, um, you know, some of you have already mentioned, I, I think this is coming so fast and furious. This is not just a policy issue. It really affects the real economy and the many industries, and particularly from our industry, what we are discussing with the regulators and the industry, the clients, is that the risk of the transition. Uh, to the new types of the uh, economy in the green, greener economy is coming so fast that we need to make sure the orderly transition. Uh, and the cy cyber is a third C. Yep. Uh, the most recent event, uh, the government hacking, uh, and all the financial institutions or corporates are making sure that we are not necessarily affected, but this is another a big wake up call that technology and the way that hacking can happen is a real threat. Uh, and the fourth, last one is, uh, uh, is a credit bubble. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are now after asking a question whether equity market has a bubble, credit market has a bubble. My personal view is it's not there yet. If you look at the, the, uh, the peel the onions of what's going on in the technology sector and some of the vulnerable sectors, it's rich, but it's not that high. And that therefore the market demand for buying more uh, is a potentially very strong. But with a very relaxed uh, monetary policy and the government spending, definitely there is a concern potentially would build up in the next two years to create another form of credit bubble. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Congressman Harmon, do you want to respond to some of these uh, and kind of well, add, I, add I, in? I, I'm Please. just wondering if the uh, if the predictions about China are too uh, optimistic. I'm usually the optimist, but I, I think there is a bipartisan view in Congress. Again, I haven't been there in a while, but this is certainly my sense, and it was true when I was there, uh, that China's a bad actor. It doesn't have to be fair, but that's the view. And that looking forward to China as a trading partner, uh, you know, a, a good actor trading partner is 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 uh, a little too too uh, optimistic. And that I think we're better off thinking about how we compete with China without going to war with China. That would not be my, my recommendation. Uh, but that, for example, on five G, um, instead of being reliant, which we now are, on Huawei technology and having China, giving China the keys to the kingdom, can't we possibly, uh, we keep talking about this, field alternatives, so software-based alternatives, which we're good at, uh, with, with like-minded countries. I mean, some in Asia, some in Europe, not just US companies, uh, to, to compete and have an alternative strategy for 5G. Things like that. I think, you know, I, I just don't see a good outcome if we don't do that. And um, I, I, so maybe I don't understand this. I, I'm sure I don't understand this as well as you do, but, but that would be one thing I would say. Um, I, I do think, you know, I, I'm glad you agree that Biden having a competent government does matter. And that I also think that government will, in addition to restoring alliances, develop a strategy for making America, my, my idea of what the Biden doctrine should be, I think it would be nice to have one, is making the, the U.S. the indispensable partner, partner, not country, partner uh, in the world. 
and we can even be China's partner and we have to be on climate, for example, I agree that you know, climate doesn't have boundaries. And we also have to figure out how to be China's partner on pandemics, not just this one, but future ones. And I don't think China has been open and I don't think it will be open on the, on the origins of this particular uh, coronavirus. Uh, but so I, I guess I'm more, and maybe this is, maybe I've evolved or something because I was uh, voted for permanent you know, uh, trading status with China in the late nineties when, when I was in Congress. But I now think I was a little bit naive. Hmm. Gaddy, you want to pick up where, where, where the Congresswoman left off there? Uh, yeah, I, uh, I would, uh, I would politely agree with you that perhaps ah. I was a bit naive, <laughs> but, uh, okay. but, you know, it's, it's, oh, e okay. it's easy, easy to say in hindsight, easy to say in hindsight. Uh, I do think, um, China, you know, China presents a very difficult challenge because it's, I think, um, often not a good actor. Uh, and I think that's pretty clear. And I think there's a reason that a bipartisan consensus or close to it has developed in Washington on that. Um, of course, the biggest reasons are to do with recent actions in China that have kind of uh, lifted the mask off of what the Chinese uh -huh. authoritarian apparatus is uh, from, the, from the camps in Hong Kong to the national security yeah. law sorry, from the camps in Xinjiang to the national security law uh, in Hong Kong and, and, and Xi Jinping uh, uh, declaring himself essentially uh, president for life or general secretary for life. <laughs> uh, on that last point, I wanted to kind of circle back uh, to, to Josh, the last part of Joshua's question about the fact that they have a longer uh, time horizon. Um, that's also both, uh, both good and bad. Um, um, I think the, the good part of that is, uh, I don't think China is is acting with urgency um, on any particular front, including uh, in the East China Sea and the South China Sea that I discussed earlier. Um, I think they see things on a longer time horizon, uh, and in that sense, I don't think we're I don't think when we're talking about uh, various global risks, that's why I don't worry as much about 2021. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the bad news is I think I worry a lot more about, you know, 2028 or, or 2030, um, because Xi Jinping has, uh, you know, a certain number of productive years left uh, as the paramount leader of China, and uh, I, I worry that uh, um, that he will want to uh, perhaps, uh, you know, take aggressive action in the region uh, to establish his legacy uh, before he's finished, and. I think China views themselves of having as having time on their side with respect to developing strength in the region, military strength uh, and economic leverage, economic strength. Uh, so that's how I'd answer your question about that. That I think the fact that China is operating on a long-term time horizon uh, makes things maybe less risky in the short in the short term, but uh, much more worrying uh, in the five to fifteen-year uh, time window. But could I just ask one question about that, Joshua? I mean, I see two things as unsustainable. In, well, maybe there are more. One is, are, are the Uyghurs going to stay in concentration camps forever? I mean, just, just asking, given you know that the world is noticing. And the second thing is Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan is assertive. A lot of people are helping ta Taiwan, including the United States. And given what happened in Hong Kong, I I, I don't know that the world is ready to go to war over you know something similar in Taiwan, but don't you think that that there there has to be a short term horizon there too, at least for U.S. policy? Yes, I, I, so I think I I can answer both of those. On on Xinjiang, um, well, they've already uh, put hundreds of thousands of Uyghurs into uh, forced labor. Uh, an unknown number of at least hundreds of thousands of Uyghurs who may have been in camps would also would now be in prison. Uh, there's been a, a clear move towards more judicial uh, means rather than extrajudicial, extrajudicial means uh, to uh, intern or imprison Uyghurs for you know, specious, uh, specious crimes. And uh, that is worrying. I mean, I think it, it, it does indicate a sort of a long-term repressive strategy. Uh, and, uh, and they're also doing it generationally. I mean, children have been separated from one or both parents, schooled in Chinese and Mandarin, uh, you uh, and not much in their native language. 
uh, you have a generational strategy in Xinjiang, and I just wrote about Tibet uh, in this week's issue. Mm -hmm. Similarly, there's a generational strategy in Tibet. The, the prize for China is future generations of Uyghurs and Tibetans and sinicizing um, their, their identity. Uh, so that's, that's my answer there. There is a long-term approach there. It's quite uh, distressing. Um, on Taiwan, uh, you're quite right that there is a need to be paying attention to it uh, right now. Uh, I'm just, what I was saying with my remarks uh, a second ago is just that I don't think, I don't anticipate, uh, you know, some sort of aggressive action for, uh, regarding Taiwan, and, you know, uh, in the very near future. But clearly China has made clear that it's, Taiwan is a priority for them, uh, strategically long-term for, you know, that's, it's long been quite clear. Uh, and I think uh, it would be uh, uh, important to Xi Jinping's legacy if he were to able to claim uh, to incorporate Taiwan into the People's Republic. Uh, and that means I do think it's quite possible to, to see invasion of Taiwan. You know, I don't think it's too dramatic to say that that's a possibility in the next 15 years. And, uh, and the US needs to be, US policy needs to be oriented around that. And it is, it is oriented around that. The island I mentioned earlier is an interesting case. Uh, I think it's an example of what China likes to do right now, which is test and probe, um, you know, test and probe how people, how other countries and other military forces respond to their actions around the region. That's true with the J Japanese self-defense forces in the Senkakus. I mean, I've, I've seen reports just the other day of a Japanese pilots are exhausted from all of the um, incursions into, into Japanese airspace. Um, and it's true um, in the South China Sea as well, uh, where they have you know, upset the Philippines with their kind of empowerment of the Coast Guard. You know, they recently just sort of essentially legalized the use of force by their Coast Guard. Um, and the, so the, the, uh, in, with, with Taiwan, with this you know, sort of unoccupied or a very barely occupied Island, you wonder would would they go further than exercises um, with a strip of land? Um, you know, they have shown an interest in unoccupied rocks in the South China Sea and the East China Sea before. Uh, I I don't know whether they would do that. I think the fact that time is on their side indicates that they're going to build up their capabilities over over years. And uh, I think over the last ten years, they've already gotten to the point where I talked to a uh, to a war gamer about a year ago about this, who said that you know they in their tabletop exercises you know five years ago they would have anticipated, assuming a U.S. intervention when China invades Taiwan, they would have anticipated that China would 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 fail. Now, uh, not so certain. It look, uh, they, so certain. You, know, you, you would think that China could succeed. I don't think China would would take that kind of action until it's certain of success. Or relative close as close to certain as you can get, but that's uh, you know I think that's that's what we're talking about when we're talking about a long time horizon that China is thinking about. Kotsky well, San, I want to bring you into the conversation in terms of these long time horizons, and also just in terms of how you plan for the short short term versus the medium and long term that we're talking about. Uh, not just in terms of stock market and financial, but when you talked about your four C's those are all very long-term uh, time horizon issues and events. How do you kind of mitigate, how do you think about uh, those risks and how do you build them into a model in terms of uh, you know, helping your clients and, and Morgan Stanley think about these issues? Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't necessarily think that this is uh, such a long term, such as like 10 years and 20 years. I mean, let, let's take an example of climate. Uh, a lot of people think that climate, you know, when we talk about climate and global warming, warming, you know, people think it's a 50 year, 100 year problem. But, uh, you know, I, I have done a lot of study on this topic uh, in the last two years. And the reality is, you know, number one is scientists tend to be extremely conservative or very careful about how we communicate, how bad this is. And the reality most likely uh, it's going to get much worse than what we are communicating already. In other words, the, the Paris Agreement might not be sufficient to actually make the world more livable. So the, the reality is, I think, in the next five, 10 years, 
uh, many organizations have to make a dramatic change to reduce the fossil fuels. And if you think about also that from the scientific perspective, there is a plenty of energy available. It's called the sun. So it's not a lack of energy. It's about how to actually build a technology, a technology to use that. Plenty of energy is available. So from that perspective, I think that a lot of farms start to really realize that this is the next 10 year issue about how to make that transition. And if you look at the equity markets uh, and the fund managers like BlackRock and Morgan Stanley's and so on is already paying so much attention on ESG because that there is a, a live or die question coming to many of the organizations. So, you know, that's just one example that the time horizon for this kind of transition is much shorter than the, what the people are anticipating. Therefore, at the Morgan Stanley, that we actually try to plan ahead to think about you know, how to do the stress testing around the certain sectors. Uh, uh, if the Biden administrations and other uh, countries agree on uh, uh, um, you know, creating the new carbon tax regime, which like most of the scientists that, uh, that argue that mm -hmm. that's the best solution uh, to actually fix the uh, global warming, warming problem. Uh, it's gonna be a massive shock immediately into the oil industries and other places. So I think in many of those things, I kind of agree with, uh, you know, Gary about, I'm not necessarily worried about 2021, but that there's a plenty of things that I listed you know, which can be a much bigger impact than the people are assuming in the next three years or maximum five years. And when we talk about another example of the credit, potential credit bubble, you know, I, I make one point about, you know, why I think that this is not the credit bubble yet. So if I go back to the pre-COVID and one of the market indices that we see is that what's, what's the credit spread over the treasury for investment grade credit. And roughly that was uh, 95 basis point. And at the peak of the uh, uh, you know, COVID situation, that went uh, as a high as like three, 370 basis point. And now it's back to the 95 mm -hmm. or 93 basis point. It's approximately the same level uh, before COVID. But why this is a right level or not so, you know, tight level? Because the government is saying to the market, whenever some challenge due to the COVID happens and corporate may go to default, they actually support those corporate. They'll buy the corporate bonds. That's what they're committing to. So I, if I am a rational investor, the credit spread should actually be tighter than pre-COVID. Because basically you are getting the government guarantee. Mm -hmm. And that's why the market level is still not that crazy. And they can go tighter. Right. But once it get tighter, a lot of economists and a lot of market participants start to worry about what the people call zombie companies. Right? Among the uh, all the complexity of the COVID influence, there are some companies which might have to go down, but they are still surviving. And the definition, the official definition of the, the zombie companies are that the company who cannot pay the interest payments based on their cash flows. And a lot of, I mean, the, the Gaddy's uh, um, uh, magazine economist, uh, you know, does a lot of great analysis about how many or proportion of the zombie companies in the US in particular is increasing. So that has to be a drug in the long term. But at this point in time, that's not necessarily a concern. It's a potentially the future concern to drag down the growth of the US economy. Right. So let me, we're getting a ton of 
questions and I really want to thank the viewers. We're getting tons of questions. I want to get to their questions because there's some great ones here. Uh, but before I do, let me just ask one, one more round uh, and then start incorporating the question. Uh, Congresswoman Harmon, for you, um, this is the end of an era in some ways. You know, I think many people know you're going to be stepping down from the Wilson Center. You serve nine terms in Congress. So I want to ask the big, the big question. Um, what, what has the last decade and more broadly your time in Washington taught us about risk and, and what are the lessons you've learned that you would impart uh, to the new generation as they, they have to confront some of these really big risks. I mean, you said at the top of the show, this is the, 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 the most significant event you've seen in your lifetime in terms of the January 6th division in our country and kind of uh, right. sitting president, you know, inciting, uh, you know, what ended up happening and not accepting the election results. Um, is it only going to get worse from here or is there some hope or something you can, you can leave us with? Well, that was pretty bad. I think, uh, you know, that almost toppled our government. If the vice president and the speaker of the house had been uh, killed, which was the intention of some of these crazy people, um, that could have thrown us into chaos. And that's what I never thought I'd see. What, what's been happening uh, and a big reason I left Congress is that toxic, what I call toxic partisanship has grown uh, in the US. It's contagious. It's sort of like COVID. Wearing a mask though doesn't fix it. And uh, uh, I don't know what the vaccine is. And our, our, our business model for politics, I'm not talking about economics, because I think there is this strange old disconnect that you know, the more money you throw at this problem, the better the markets do. Uh, at least temporarily. But uh, the business model in politics is blame the other side for not solving the problem. Because if you work with the other side, you are bipartisan. And if you are bipartisan, someone's gonna run a, an opponent against you in your primary the next time. You know, to the left of you, if you're a Democrat, that happened to me three times, I won every time, don't worry. But, uh, or to the right of you, if you're a Republican, which is why the people in the center are losing or leaving. Uh, four uh, moderate Republicans have just announced that they're leaving. I mean, one of them is older, but some of them are not older. Uh, they're just, you know, frustrated. So if there's no center and the business model is blame the other side and you put your reelection ahead of your country, which is what I think we may see in some votes in the Senate, uh, whenever the votes are on uh, whether to convict President Trump, um, the, the prognosis for solving problems is poor, poor. And I said, you know, foreign policy by executive order is not, it's not a, an, adequate, uh, a, an adequate outcome. So, uh, you know, what do I see? Um, sadly, you did ask uh, that the risk of not solving problems increases. I think we'll solve a few problems. Uh, hope COVID will be on that list uh, temporarily anyway, because I think pandemics are in our future. I don't think we'll solve climate. I don't see how we're going to solve climate anyway, anytime soon. And it's a huge risk, and I completely agree that it can't wait. Uh, and I don't, uh, you know, if we're now anti-trade-ish, I mean, not totally, uh, I don't see how we're going to build the, or play in the world economy where we need to play. Other people are going to set the rules, and we're going to be left out. So I, you know, I, I don't know why I'm so pessimistic. I think it's just been a long week, and I'm sorry I'm pessimistic, because... I usually am not, but I <laughs> well, am right worry. now. We're not going to end there because we've got some questions that will keep okay. you on your toes there. Uh, let me come to you, uh, Gaddy. We have a specific question from Hiroaki Nakanishi who, who wants to know, based on a lot of the conversation, how can we confront China in the way of incentivizing or socializing uh, them into the world system as a responsible global stakeholder of power to join and maintain and advance a global commons, a rule of law, common values, et cetera? Wow, uh, the premise of that question is difficult for me to to uh, uh, to sign on to. I don't think China is interested in 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 Thanks. in being a part of the uh, a rules based order that, in the way that America uh, and the West view the rules based global order. Uh, China is trying to change uh, the global order and the rules uh, to make to sort of make uh, make the international system. Uh, more more amenable uh, to how China behaves, uh, both in the region uh, and inside its own borders. Uh, that has been the the trend, uh, especially more aggressively under under Xi Jinping. 
so uh, I kind of question the premise, which is a pessimistic way to answer the question. Uh, I think, uh, you know, this is, as I talked about, um, it bears repeating that uh, this is going to be the challenge of the Biden administration and other countries around the world. How do you deal with um, a, a, the second largest economy, a country with massive influence around the world uh, that uh, behaves in ways um, that are uh, actually you know, abominable um, and, uh, but you still need their cooperation. You need them to be a good actor on major issues like climate change, um, like, uh, the, like pandemics uh, and future pandemics as Congresswoman um, Harmon just, uh, just mentioned correctly. Uh, on nuclear security. And as I said before, I, I think the key here is uh, the only way is to persuade uh, Xi Jinping uh, and uh, the people around him of what is in their interest that aligns, uh, aligns with the world on those issues. I think it's a lot to hope for uh, to, 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 to suggest that America can bring China into sort of a uh, into the global order as a good actor. Uh, uh, th there's not much of indication of that. Um, I, th I, I'm, I worry much more about just trying to contain, uh, you know, how much bad behavior, you know, uh, that uh, the West will have to have to deal with with China. And I, a couple things on that point, actually, uh, uh, both re related to both of our other speakers' points. One on cyber, uh, and also on uh, kind of decoupling and tech. Uh, and, and this actually relates to what the Congresswoman just said about, uh, uh, about domestic politics. One of the Biden administration's uh, priorities in foreign policy and in China policy, they've made clear, is to strengthen the home front uh, and to invest in the United States, invest in infrastructure, um, invest in tech, in 5G. Uh, those things, those are all, sorry, those things are all harder uh, to do uh, in a politically polarized landscape that we have in Washington. And when you have, you do have a, right now, a Republican party that as when uh, President Obama came into office, uh, uh, similarly uh, was determined not to have, uh, not to let um, the new democratic administration claim successes. Right. So I, th I think that's going to be, uh, you know, President Biden's already uh, quite made clear that he recognizes that challenge and that he wants to try and find um, ways to work with Republicans. And if he can't, then they will pass, they will work to pass, um, you know, aggressive initiatives, uh, ambitious initiatives if they need to without the Republicans. But with a filibuster uh, in the Senate, uh, with a narrow 51-50 uh, um, majority with the vice president casting the deciding vote, that's a very tall order. And if you can't do that, then you have, um, uh, then you have, I think, long-term concerns about our infrastructure, our tech infrastructure as well, uh, which I think um, is vulnerable on, uh, on the cyber front. So, Hotsky-san, uh, you seem to be the optimist here. Uh, you have two very <laughs> it's strong a, it's a, it's a may, this, this has never happened in my life. I'm usually <laughs> the most pessimistic person, so... Yeah. Uh, that's good. So the question we have here is actually from Jacqueline, who wants to see, do you see cyber security risk as a general risk or more likely something against specific companies or something that's more nefarious against governments? Like how do, when you when you talked about that sea of cyber security, you talked about the government hack and the Florida water plan and just some really scary dystopian things that could result from there. How do you look at cyber security? Yeah, I, I think the uh, I, I am I am talking more specifically that uh, uh, all of us need to think about uh, how to protect ourselves against the cyber attack in the broad sense in a much more practical way. And it's not about uh, oh my goodness the cyber is scary and uh, what should I do type of thing. Uh, and what I mean is. Um, in, in the industry of cyber risk management, uh, there is a, number one is that there is a word uh, named the cyber poverty line. And you know, what it means is that so many corporate, local governments, uh, school, municipality, policy, and so on, they just cannot afford to have a minimum standards of the cyber protection because it's just so expensive. 
And the firm like Morgan Stanley can't afford it. And we afford to hire a lot of uh, ex-NSA people uh, from, uh, from the you know, ex-government agency mm-hmm. people to do the real state-of-the-art cyber defense. And still, it's very hard. So from that perspective, uh, I do have a lot of interactions with uh, cyber experts as well as the uh, uh, industry about what we have to focus on and what we need to accept. And right now, Mm -hmm. that there is no common standards to think about what is acceptable cyber risk that we can take. And it's going to be a long conversation, but there's a practical way for the, each corporation and the, each entity to decide how do we spend money and how do we protect ourselves to, you know, basically protect our treasure, you know, whether it's information uh, or the certain types of the, uh, uh, you know, wealth. Uh, so that that step needs to be taken place. Otherwise, that uh, you know, a lot of things can be lost uh, without our notice uh, to potentially um, other uh, malicious uh, attackers is, is what I'm talking about. Hey, Joshua, could I jump in on that for a second? Please, please. I, uh, there was a story that made the rounds uh, in the last day or two uh, that some of you may have seen uh, about uh, a hacker's attempt to, uh, to poison the water supply of a town in Florida, yeah. in Oldsmar, in Pinellas mm-hmm. County, and uh, it was it was it was detected by some alert uh, public servant, uh, and uh, we're fortunate for that. But it just sort of shows you the the scale of the problem uh, that we're talking about here, and uh, that it can happen anywhere. Uh, and I would recommend uh, I'd commend to people uh, to to look for um, a new book by uh, New York Times reporter Nicole. Pearl Roth called, um, I think it's called, this is, this is how they tell me the world ends on, on about, about cyber weapons. Uh, there was an excerpt of it published uh, just a few days ago that was uh, fascinating and, and disturbing. Um, and it just uh, talks about the kind of decades long history of uh, kind of ignoring defense for the sake of offense uh, and the Pandora's box that was opened by the use of, for instance, Stuxnet in, in, our, in Iran, uh, uh, it's a, you know, we, they're basically there's uh, multiple uh, state actors and non-state actors around the world that have uh, tools at their disposal that are, um, are quite frightening. And, uh, uh, and there's not nearly a mu- enough uh, invested in systematic defenses. Well, but, so let me add to that. I have a book to recommend called The Perfect Weapon by David Sanger, the New York Times reporter. The book was written at the Wilson Center, so of course it's the best book on the subject. But it starts I read with Stuxnet. It. I read it already. <laughs> it's pretty good. Yep. It starts with Stuxnet. And you're not wrong that uh, we kind of, uh, we did it so everybody else feels empowered that they can do it. And it's not just state actors, it's non-state actors. You know, a bunch of crazies can do it, and including in the United States. And um, I, I think this, this uh, solar wind uh, attack, the recent one, is colossally scary. Let's just all you know, be uh, negative again, uh, because our government didn't find it. Uh, it was FireEye, a private company that found it. They were in our networks, many private and public networks, for eight months. And it is also true that to do cyber, you have to be in somebody else's network. So the, the chance of miscalculation, people thinking they're being attacked when actually we're just there to defend ourselves to make sure we're not being attacked, is huge, uh, which is a point David makes and uh, Sanger makes. And so, um, you know, uh, I think this whole conversation is a downer, but uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but uh, I think that's... Right, I, I think... Yeah, I just was going to say it's a, it's another thing to put on the list to worry about very seriously. But I think one 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 slight positive tone I wanted to uh, add on the cyber is that the fact that we cannot have a perfect protection and let's admit it, and then you know whatever it's a corporate governance or other forum, and to really have a conversation about where to draw the line and the spend uh, 
spend the effort and the money uh, in a realistic form. If you think deeper, you can actually do it, but it's very hard to accept right. from the board of directors and so on. Like, what do you mean by you cannot protect, protect us in the perfect shape? Right. But even government couldn't do it. So, I mean, that's, that's right. a kind of practical progress all of us, us have to work on. Right. Yeah. I think so managing risk, last thing I would say, is that is what you have to think about across the board, managing risk. Yeah not eliminating risk. All right. So let, let me ask, I mean, this is Japan society, so I've kind of held my Japan questions, but we've gotten enough questions from the audience. I have to ask it. This is a very optimistic question, so I'm sure that we'll find a way to make it pessimistic by the time we twist this. But uh, let, let, let me start with you, Congresswoman Harmon. It's about the Olympics. And basically the ah. question is, uh, you know, let me frame this, right? Um, we all know that the Olympics are supposed to happen this summer and Tokyo, and there's real pessimism inside of Tokyo and in Japan more broadly. The, the, the geopolitical context that I, I want Gaddy to weigh in here as well is that literally six months later, you have another Olympics uh, starting the Winter Olympics. And so, you know, I think right now everyone's looking at Japan and some of the comments that have been made and the political furor going on there and looking at it as an isolated incident. The question is, do you see this as a broader uh, geopolitical competition where this could be the beginning of the end uh, in terms of the U.S.-China? Because if Japan can't hold the uh, Olympics uh, in the middle of this pandemic and show a sense of resiliency and come together, uh, you know, in some ways this is like COVID all over again, where we're going to have the Chinese rubbing it in our face that they handled the Olympics and they handled the virus better than we did. Um, do you do you see that geopolitical context? And the specific question here was: Do you think the Olympics is an opportunity to come together uh, to, for world leaders to be able to actually uh, come together in this moment uh, and 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 work together against emerging concerns and threats? Do you think that in a post-COVID world, this Olympics could be a positive thing? In a post-COVID world, yeah, I do. But I, we're not in a post-COVID world. <laughs> And I think having a super spreader event for the world in Japan wouldn't be the best thing for Japan. Now we just saw, I don't know, it's, it's too soon, but uh, since I, I don't know that much about football, but I know I love Tom Brady. So I watched <laughs> the Super Bowl. I don't. Uh, uh, I just do. I mean, oh, oh, okay. But, uh, and you know, that was weird and great. I mean, very few people were there. They were wearing masks, they were separated. They had all these fake people people in, in the seats. And it was, I don't know how many multi-millions watched that thing, but it was, a, I would say, unless everybody gets sick in another week, tentatively say, this is positive comment, that it was a success. So how do you mount the Olympics? I mean, it's, you know, a hundred X what the Super Bowl was, but, um, uh, you know, I, I guess my, my sort of instinct is the summer is too soon uh, because we won't be through COVID. But in theory, if, you, if the question is longer term, is this a good, good thing for the world? I think it's a good thing for the world. Gaddy, how do you think about this in terms of the, the competing Olympics, you know, in Asia, you know, we've had three Olympics in a row there. There'd never be a peacetime uh, Olympics that's canceled like this in Japan. How do you think about that? And how do you think the Chinese think about this more broadly? Mm. Well, I think uh, at least on the surface, China probably has a, an interest in Japan's Olympics going off well, uh, because they would like uh, Japan and others to come to their Olympics uh, without issue uh, uh, six months later. And if, I, if you want me to put a pessimistic gloss on this, uh, I, th I think uh, the question, you know, having an Olympics in Beijing uh, while they are being accused of human rights atrocities um, in Xinjiang, uh, is is going to be. Uh, it, it, I mean, I you know there are calls for boycotts. Uh, I don't expect that movement to uh, to gain momentum amongst the major countries, but uh, you know it's, it's, that issue is going to be lurking mm -hmm. out there. Human, human rights groups, you know, many of them have called for the Olympics to be uh, moved from Beijing or moved from China altogether. Uh, so that's sort of the back, the political backdrop there. It's kind of hard to, to, to think of it as a, as the whole world coming together uh, when you have, uh, when you have it set against those human rights abuses. Yeah. Uh, I was talking about Japan, not China, holding it in Japan. Yeah, yeah no, yes, that. of course. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, and, and I think Joshua was kind of asking about the, the Olympics coming up six months after that. Uh, I, I do, I do think, you know, I think China and Japan had recently uh, kind of on this, you know, at least uh, publicly 
declared to be kind of positive bilateral uh, talks in the last few months. Uh, and part of that was saying that they were going to work towards making each other's Olympics a success. Uh, China definitely has an interest in that. Obviously, Japan does too, uh, but for different reasons, I think. Mm -hmm. Otsuki-san, uh, if you were giving advice uh, to the Olympic Committee and, and in Japan in particular, how, how would you even go about uh, assessing, uh, you know, uh, Congresswoman Harmon called a super spreader event. How would you even go about figuring out how to, how to deal with the risk of this magnitude? I mean, that's a great question. I think my, my recommendation is to try to try to uh, manage to reduce that tail risk, which is the, exactly what the Congressman Harmon said. You don't want to take the risk of making this as a, uh, the global disaster. Right. And therefore, the question is that, well, let's move on that we can have, let's say, no audience events mm -hmm. and uh, you know, t t uh, cut the tail risk and try to make sure that we can actually operate like that, right? Making everything right to, to try to be ready for that type of event. Uh, and uh, let's assume that the vaccines and production will you know, catch up you know, so that uh, you know, many of the participants uh, will be protected. And then I think that there will be a reasonable chance to host. Uh, and as Gary said, I think that if there is a common interest for China and Japan and the US and others to actually um, hold it, I think it's quite plausible. I mean, now one, one, one thing I want to add around the COVID, which I forgot to mention, I was reading our research report and they were looking at the data of Israel. And as you know, that Israel has the uh, uh, highest coverage uh, of the population using vaccine, that they are already you know, going beyond 50%. Hmm. And somebody did the back testing of those that have the vaccines has already worked. And the short answer is as expected, that there was a reduction of the 92% effectiveness you know, for the population that uh, used the vaccine. So, the early sign of the real use of the vaccine is actually showing and supporting the evidence from all this test. So if that's the case and production follows, our research people, the bio, bio, you know, bio you know, chemical research people is predicting at least for the major like G10 countries, majority of the country will most, most likely have the enough vaccines by the middle of the summer. So if that is really true, then that would really help to hold the Olympics. Right. But it's cutting it close. And uh, you know, I, just a full on traditional Olympics with, I don't know how many people come to this thing and every country is welcome you know, to bring as many folks as possible. I, I think that's impossible this year. I agree. Yeah. So, so let me let, let me try to, to wind this up because I did promise Congresswoman Harmon, who just got her vaccine. Speaking of vaccines, uh, that I, we would try to end this a little early. Um, I do want to try to end this on an optimistic note, but we have a question here from uh, Satoru Murase, who's from our board, and he he's asking about you know, given the, the picture you guys have painted here, um, what do you say to your son's daughters? Uh, you know, in terms of you know, it may be really bleak now or pretty pessimistic, but do you have a longer term view where things are positive or? Optimistic? optimistic like what g give us your optimistic take on how it may be really dark right now but there's something better okay. out there well uh, let me try because Satoru Morasi is a friend of mine and I used to practice law with his father so hello how are you anyway uh, that was a long time ago I call myself a recovering politician and a recovering lawyer um, I'm not sure but, so now I'm a grandmother that's a good thing and I actually am optimistic about that uh because I think that uh, the world, the traditional world, or my world, uh, I don't know how traditional I am. I think I'm kind of fun and, you know, uh, not so. But I, I think my world um, uh, is, is more inflexible than the world my children live in. And certainly than the world my, than the vision that my, my grandchildren have. And so I think, um, Short term, 
my, you know, my generation has to manage us out of this uh, nightmare. Um, but I think longer term, better answers are going to come from my children. They're going to have a better view of the world. I think they are less uh, stuck in, in tribal politics than my generation, uh, much less. Uh, I think that's true. Um, and yes, some of these angry people who stormed the Capitol are young and, and scary. But I think more young people are open to uh, uh, to other people than than maybe my generation. So I also think they're very fluent with technology, and the future is a tech future, uh, and it, uh, our whole future is a tech future. The good good thing about COVID, if you can say, I'm saying one more positive thing. That's it. That's all I got. Uh, is that we have leapfrogged uh, a lot of old stuff. Uh, uh, with technology. It's not just uh, Operation Warp Speed, and I give Trump credit for that, which has helped uh, um, um, uh, accelerate the development of vaccines. But when we deliver them, when we finally get, get organized to deliver them, that will be an acceleration. And the answer to infrastructure and all the kinds of things that we should be doing now to, to get to a greener economy all have to do with technology. And, and driverless cars and using solar, I completely agree in ways that will uh, replace fossil fuels, which uh, are disappearing anyway. And so, and I think kids know this better. So what do I say? I say, uh, you know, uh, I don't think I'm, I'm done yet, but, but I think that uh, I, I have growing respect for answers uh, that are coming out of the younger generation. Great, thank you, Gaddy. What would you What would you say? Yeah, well, I'll start that answer on a on a pessimistic note, which is we haven't really even addressed the kind of epistemological crisis uh, of our age. You know, the poisoned information environment, um, That's true. Uh, and and the media poisoned media media ecosystem. So you know, online, Fox News, what have you, uh, and our inability to share a set of facts. Uh, and this is something that's also weaponized by authoritarian countries, um, whether it's China or Russia um, or elsewhere. And I, I do worry about uh, overcoming that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as the Congresswoman said, I think there's a lot of hope in future in the, in the next generation who are more savvy than, than we are, uh, who are less naive about technology uh, than our, our generations have been. Uh, and I think, um, I do. I do think that they can have. They can. They will come along with solutions, with less, uh, with their eyes open uh, about the dangers of technology, um, and with more urgency uh, about climate change. And I, I would say that that's that's the area of climate change where uh, it's hard for me to say I'm, I'm an optimist uh, because of you know we've there's been so much inaction for too long, um, but I do think that we can come up with better answers. As a as a human race, and I think that uh, I I have some faith in in future generations to come to to help solve those problems. But of course, those problems need to be solved like instantly, <laughs> right now. So there has to, there's a lot of work to do. Uh, yeah. So there's I have it's a mix of optimism and pessimism. I just you know periods of a, a major technological change always come with uh, shocks, and that's what we're going through now. The thing is that the the consequences and the uh, stakes are so high uh, that right. they're existential for the planet. And uh, so I, I'm hopeful that, uh, uh, as they say, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it will bend towards justice. Thank you. holtzke how would you answer that? <laughs> I, I definitely want to take this unique uh, unique opportunity to, to make me sound like a, the positive person because it really happens. Um, but I'm actually um, positive in a sense of that, you know, we, we, we quite focus on the risk and that's why, you know, we, we have a tendency to sound negative because we are talking about the downside. But in the broader sense, I don't think it is that bad because even, you know, again, talking about climate, I, I think this is the entirely incentive problem. Once we fix the incentive, such as carbon tax, because effectively what has been going on, it's a free rider problem, mm -hmm. right? The corporates has been 
creating this external negative externality without you know paying any cost. The economists always say, therefore, you have to internalize the cost and you have to pay the cost that society has to pay. Once you you know fix the incentive problem, as I said, there is enough supply of energy in the universe. So I think we have to make the transition work. So from that perspective, I think that uh, we can we can find a solution. Yep. Um, and and uh, you know other stuff like a cyber. As I said, it's so scary, but uh, there, there is definitely the way to internalize and uh, try to think about the practical solution about it. So you know my attitude. Is as a risk manager, manager is uh, as others said that there is always a way to find in how to manage the risk and accept a certain risk but without eliminating it, and we just need to be practical. Practical and uh, uh, we have to optimize. Yep. And and the last thing I want to say is uh, when I grew up in Japan in the 60s and 70s, Japan was an emerging market. And now Japan is so much richer. And I, I say the same thing in China. When I was in Japan in the 80s and 90s, I go to China, as Gary knows, that it was such a poor country. So despite the, all the tension and challenge we have, the whole world is getting much, much better in terms of wealth and the living standards. So if you think about this, you know, the, all these trends, then there's so many things that we can be positive about. I, I I'm, I'm very impressed that despite the way we began that with the pessimism based on discussing all the risk and you guys have really taken us on a tour de force around the world, uh, we've kind of <laughs> emerged on this optimistic tone, maybe by, by force. Um, I can't uh, resist but taking this opportunity to, to point out uh, that Japan and all the conversations we just had has a role and Japanese have a tendency, I think Hotsuki-san mm -hmm. can agree with me on this, to be very pessimistic and hard on themselves. And yet I think the, the comments you all have made and kind of what's gonna be needed for the future, not just in this country in the United States, not just in terms of how we engage a rising power like China, all roads in some ways lead through a, a partner like uh, Japan. Japan, that as the third largest economy, people forget very quickly right. uh, that it still is the third largest economy. It is in some ways an indispensable partner that we hope uh, the United States and the U.S. through its U.S.-Japan alliance continues on. So, uh, you know, I think even though we didn't mention Japan as much, obviously talking about the Olympics and others, it has a role to play. And that's why I'm so proud to be able to host uh, you all and to be able to share this conversation yeah. uh, with our audience. So with that, let me uh, just uh, let each person just say a, a word uh, of, of sign off and then we'll go from there and make sure that Congresswoman uh, Harmon's able to recover uh, from her shot. So Congressman <laughs> Harmon, let me let me well, give you the last word. So far, so good. Uh, I'm still here and nothing hurts yet. Uh, I, Japan, I mean, we didn't talk much about Japan, but I'm very optimistic about Japan. I mean, Japan's a leader in technology. Uh, Japan is a, a fascinating country. Japan picked up the reins that we dropped, mm, that President Trump dropped on TPP, and I thought that was fabulous. And could, uh, whether we join or rejoin or we don't rejoin, I think it's a huge new role for Japan. And Japan is also, you know, part of that other trading alliance with China. And so I, I think that Japan is doing a, a lot of things right. And I gather that Suga has a goal of uh, uh, a carbon-free universe by uh, 2035, I don't know whether, Japan gets there, but I think that's very ambitious and 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 worth applauding. So uh, my close would be um, the U.S. Um, uh, has to dig out of a deep hole, but Japan is uh, in pretty good shape. Daddy, yeah, just to, to to follow up on both of those remarks, and I think it, it would serve uh, serve the U.S. and Japan well uh, to. Uh, to work closely together. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Abe had a, had a good personal relationship with Trump. Um, I, you know, I don't get the sense that we're, we're seeing that uh, yet with uh, Suga and Biden. Uh, and of course, Japan has its own domestic kind of uh, political situation to get through. Uh, and I, you know, I think Suga was hoping to come in February to Washington. And that won't happen. And I'm sure that's a disappointment. Uh, I, I do think, uh, you know, but the Biden administration has uh, made it a priority to work with allies in the region. 
I think Japan, uh, Japanese officials have been sensitive in the past about how the Obama administration uh, dealt with them uh, in the region. And there's been, you know, it's, it wasn't always smooth sailing. And I, I, I do have hope to end on another optimistic note that that relationship will be, uh, I think, will be smoother uh, uh, during the during the Biden administration. And I think they have tailwinds with, with the, um, the challenges that are posed in the region uh, and they have incentives to work uh, closely together. Great. Holtzkusan. Yeah, I want to I want to uh, mention two facts from like the economy perspective about Japan. One is uh, I've got the exact number, but last five, six years, the growth in labor productivity in Japan is one of the highest among the G10 countries. So, in fact, quietly, Japan has been improving the productivity. A lot of people don't notice it. And that's one thing that our research told me. The other thing is, if you look at the trade balance with Japan versus the, all the other world countries, U.S. is about 15 percent. China is 27 percent. Asia as a whole is more than 50 percent. I think it was like 55 percent. And Asia is growing. So by definition, Japan has a tremendous opportunity to grow. So there's a lot of positive things that we can think as an opportunity for the Japan to grow. And the only thing I think as a Japanese guy looking from the US, the only thing I wish Japan can do better is that they can uh, speed up the changes to grab those opportunities. Hmm. Hmm. It's a great place to end on. So I wanna thank uh, Congressman Harmon. Thank you for joining. Thank you for your service uh, along your long career. I'm looking forward uh, that your best days are still ahead of you. We look forward to inviting you back uh, and thank you for being thank such you. a longtime friend with Japan Society in Japan as well. Uh, Gaddy Epstein, thank you for joining us uh, and, and the reporting you're doing. And then obviously Keiji Hotsky uh, from Morgan Stanley and uh, on, on the board of Japan Society. Thank you and good evening to everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good evening.